I focused on suicide and depression in gifted students. Um, some of the norms that I established, I can't take credit for because I did find it on the internet, but I really resonated with them. They are allow everyone a chance to speak, listen respectfully and actively. I really like the idea of criticizing ideas, not individuals, because at least with my students and a lot of the time with adults, whenever we are disagreed with or someone contends an idea, um, we feel almost attacked, uh, like they are attacking us personally, not our ideas. And taking that out of the equation completely saying that we are discussing ideas, not individuals, was really helpful. Uh, commit to learning, not debating. Avoid blame, speculation, and inflammatory language. And avoid assumptions about others, especially based on the perceived social groups. Now, one of the reasons I identified with this norm the most is connected actually to our topic, suicide and depression, in the fact that a lot of gifted kids are overlooked and are, because people assume that they are there academically, so they are there emotionally, that they don't need help um, because they are advanced, when a lot of the time that is the opposite. They do need our help. So for our dialogue activity, I had my group uh, write on whiteboards characteristics and struggles of gifted students, and I gave them five minutes to do so. I set a little timer, and while they were doing that, I had on my whiteboard risk factors of depression and suicidal ideation. My list included asynchronous development, social isolation, neurotic perfectionism, overexcitability, high sensitivity, heightened awareness of world problems, and feeling of powerlessness and frustration. Now, when we were done, and I had explained everything, uh, because a lot of the times general education teachers didn't know what asynchronous development is, might not know uh, what is neurotic perfectionism versus perfectionism. So we went over some of the definitions first, just so we were all on a level playing field, and we then circled anything on their boards that connected with my boards. And it was kind of astonishing. So their responses are below. Um, I'm gonna leave this up so you can peruse and while you do that, I'm going to talk about my participants. I had Miss Holly Jays, who is a fifth grade ELA teacher at Looking Heights. Miss Bethany Davis, a sixth and eighth grade ELA and math gifted teacher at Reynoldsburg City Schools. Miss Amber Prater, a sixth grade humanities clustered grouping teacher at Watkins. And Miss Kaylee Fowler, a seventh grade clustered grouping teacher at Reynoldsburg. So I wanted specifically uh, to name their credentials because I wanted a variety of places. Um, so that it wasn't one area. I also wanted different grade levels um, as well as I wanted different teaching environments. So I have a general education teacher, one who has experienced clustered grouping, and a gifted teacher in and of itself because I feel like a lot of opinions depend on your experience. So if you want to read their responses, you can, I will say anything that is underlined is what we decided connected to my list of risk factors for depression and suicidal ideations. You'll notice the uh, general education teacher and the group grouping, clustered grouping teachers have a lot of underlines and a lot of connections, whereas the gifted teacher did not, which we later went in on and discussed. So a kind of overview of our discussion. A lot of our general education teachers were very worried about all the data and I was giving them percentages and all of these things. And they were so very worried about our gifted kids, which makes sense when they are so often overlooked. Um, we talked about how the gifted teacher is gonna focus more on the struggles that are less noticeable. They're gonna talk about 
um, more of what te- what she sees the teachers doing and less on what the kids are doing. So she, um, if you remember, she says they're disorganized to your eye, but they have a way that they know things are. They are often overlooked if they're gifted creativity, but they are still gifted. All of these things that are going to be less... Um, in your face, to say the least. And she recognizes that gifted kids are often kind of forgotten, almost because they are functioning in the classroom, that you miss a lot of the red, uh, red flags, that something is happening and that they are struggling because you are focusing on um, the student who's struggling academically. We talked about how it's the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And a lot of the time, the squeaky wheel is not your gifted students because that's not what they need. They don't need as much of your um, remediation. We spent time focusing also on neurotic perfectionism and how quickly that can turn into self-hate. And... um, We talked about an article that was saying gifted students are more likely to get eating disorders than other students just because of that perfectionism, because they are so focused on that black and white reality that they're not able to accept that gray area and how that can doubly affect the mental and emotional well-being of gifted students. Um, We also talked a little bit about the real world problems. Uh, COVID-19 has not been good for our gifted students where we have a lot of fretting. We've had a lot of um, late nights with our kids researching and coming up with all of this information. And um, one student apparently was going to build a ventilation system in their basement And um, they were so focused on that. Um, Another teacher was talking about when the Flint water was a huge point of discussion, they came in with bounds and barrels of information, having researched throughout the night. And it's it's very hyper-focused for gifted kids, is they will focus on these impacts and can it can lead to them trying to figure it out. And a lot of these problems are very difficult to figure out because they are world problems that are difficult to, for lack of a better word. Now, the main question we came away with is where are the supports for these kids? If it is found that these risk factors and these characteristics are so closely connected, why do we not have more data, more studies, more counselors impacting change in schools. And we mentioned that almost all of our gifted kids, when we're looking at their records, had anxiety disorders. And while we're not saying that those are connected, we're saying that the fact that it is a case that we recognize is something that should be looked into. Um, Especially in Generation Z, the kids we're seeing today, they're not getting that outside interaction, especially with COVID. And even their interaction, if they do have it, is not personal. It's through a phone. So they're becoming in their own heads constantly, and they're feeling isolated, which is then exacerbating the issues. Now, Uh, Here is their reflection responses. I will include uh, in the top right corner if you would like to take the form. It is there for you to take. But here are their responses to the three questions asked. The questions were, what was or were the most valuable part of this dialogue? What suggestions do you have for the facilitator, aka me, if I were to do this dialogue with students? And is there anything you would like to tell me? Um, I will pause, or you can pause it here, if you want to read their specific responses. Um, Sorry if the font is a little small in some cases. Some people were very uh, wordy 
and lengthy in their responses, and other people were kind of succinct and short. Um, general overview, in case you didn't want to read all of them. So the main focus and the important lesson that they learned was about how we need to acknowledge and include social emotional learning into our curriculum at school. Uh, while we might be bogged down with schedules and testing and mandates and uh, district qualifications and all of these things, focusing on the kids' well-being needs to be of importance. And I feel like, and they feel like, a lot of this time, this is given um, a push to the back. Uh, they also recommend, specifically because of how deep this topic is, sensitizing it a little bit, because um, I gave them the statistics. I didn't kind of shy away from the darker areas of this topic. They recommended sensitizing it a little bit, making sure that I have that baseline with kids so that it's not as upfront in their face, kind of um, emotional as it would be if I kind of just went in cold turkey. Now, personally, I really liked the dialogue and I think it went well. Like I said, I was really happy that I got such a varied group of educators. Um, and it kind of reminded us to check in with our gifted kids. Because looking back, I can see where I might have been like, oh, they're okay. And to find out later that they are going through issues, you kind of feel like there's, it's been pulled over your head where I never saw this coming, whereas it's most likely that we didn't think to look for it. Um, and I found it extremely interesting that all the gen ed teachers were so surprised and worried and the gifted teacher was well aware of it. She was kind of like, yes, this happens. Yes, this, 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 and this. Here's my personal anecdotes. Here's my personal experiences. It's common. Um, and I think that just shows how little training or talk or professional development we have that is available uh, surrounding the plight of gifted students. And we kind of focus more on getting those lower kids up and I've had thousands and that, not thousands, hundreds of hours of PD on how to build my lower kits, but I don't remember a single PD on working with my gifted kits. And I just find that so interesting.